Am I good? Sweet. Well, good morning, Belmar Church. I am uh, incredibly excited and honored that uh, I was invited by Pastor Daryl to come up here and preach. Uh, a little bit nervous as well. Uh, as Daryl said, my voice is a little funny. It's making my things sound a little more dramatic than normal, so <laughs> that's why. Because my voice like this is a little squeak. That's what's going on. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know if you've ever had one of those weeks where like, you know, your voice is going, you're, you're just so busy and nothing seems to be going according to plan. I feel like that's kind of the week I've had leading up to this. And I'm just like, God, you've, I've, I've been given this opportunity to preach. Why don't you just make the whole week just perfect for me? You know, obviously I'm this great person that you want to be up in front of the church. So you should be taking care of me and protecting me. And yet that hasn't quite been the thing. Not that God has abandoned me, but it's been such a hectic week for me. And I've just been like, God, what are you trying to do here? And and I'm sure many of us have felt that same way sometimes too, where we've gone through just certain situations where we're trying to figure out, God, what are you doing right here? What's going on? You know, and we, we, we prayed to begin this service and I, I feel the, the, the pain of just, not just our country, but our world. There's, there's so many things going on and it makes us wonder, God, what are you doing? Or what are you not doing? Do something. And, and today we're gonna see in the person of Daniel, a man who fought fear with faith and, and who stepped out boldly to the point of even surrendering his life. And even tells us and demonstrates for us how to find hope in the midst of adversity. I really like his story. And if you'll turn with me to Daniel chapter one, we're gonna, we're gonna go through some scripture today. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna read the Bible. It's gonna be good. Um, so I'm gonna try to get as much of it as I can in. But Daniel, if, you, if you're not familiar with the story of Daniel, he was a young guy, at least when the story picks up. He lived in Jerusalem and it was taken over by the armies of Babylon. And then he was pretty much like, people, it was a battle that lasted like three days. People were killed. He was taken as a prisoner of war back to Babylon. He was taken out of his country. And that alone, I mean, taken out of his country, given different food, different name. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine like how he's, how he's got, how he must be feeling, what he's thinking. God, what are you doing? And so we see him in uh, verse eight, or prior to that in verse five, it talks about how the king appointed a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. This idea was the king was gonna give him all this food, right? So Daniel says in verse eight, here's we're gonna read eight and nine. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And so that basically kind of wrap it up because like I said, we're going we're gonna to hit, ma- hit three major things. These are kind of the three things Daniel is mostly known for. Is his, the whole diet situation, him interpreting a dream, and the last one is him in the den. So diet, dream, den. We're going to hit those three things. And what we're going to find out today is we're going to see that when we recognize the sovereignty of God in our lives, we can trust his plan and follow him in obedience no matter the cost. So Daniel and I, I think it's really easy to read over this. He's saying, hey, um, main chief boss guy for the king, I'm not gonna eat the king's food. Now, I don't wanna just read over that. This is the food the king ate. The king would have been eating some really good food. He would have been eating the best stuff in the land. One that was probably really appealing. Like I'm imagining like filet mignon wrapped in bacon and all that kind of stuff and like some really, really good food. And Daniel says, I'm not gonna eat that. Immediately off the bat, we're gonna see Daniel putting himself in a really dangerous position. By refusing to eat the king's food, he's essentially insulting the king. Not only that, but he was among many other people who had also been taken as prisoners of war to be trained and led up to be leaders in Babylon. And they would have been pressuring him. What are you doing, Daniel? Why aren't you eating the food? You're, you're going to get yourself killed. Just do it. Just do it. So he's dealing with that exterior pressure. And then let, let's go back and consider how he got there. The God that he served allowed his country to be destroyed, his people to be taken captive. How easy do you think it would be to feel bitter about that? To say, God, where were you when that happened? Where were you when my family and friends were being killed and and just taken captive into a whole other country with these people who don't even believe in you? They pray to stars. I think we can relate to that sometimes where we find ourselves saying, God, why aren't you here? Why aren't you helping us in this moment? 
But yet Daniel continues to persevere. He follows God. Despite the fact that he's miles away from his country. Despite the fact that nobody would know. And despite the fact that he's kind of in a, a tough spot where he could be legitimately risking his life. If you were to read on to the next verse, the, um, the chief guy would say, I'm afraid that if, if you look bad, then you would endanger my head before the king. So obviously it's not too illogical or irrational to imagine that the king would just, you know, off of their head kind of thing. The stakes are high. And I kind of wonder about ourselves. The only thing I can think of to kind of draw this back and, and kind of relate it to our time right now is when we talk about tithing. You know, the, statistically, in the church, about 25% of the people will tithe. And on average, it's about 2.5%. And I wonder if it's because we're afraid to give God kind of what he's given us. This income we have. Here in America, if you have money, you can do a lot of things. You have control. You feel safe. You feel secure. And I wonder, much like Daniel is willing to put himself out there in obedience to God, trusting that God would handle the situation and take care of it, I feel really challenged by that. I feel really challenged by the fact that God, I'm going I'm to give away 10% of my income and, and I hope that I have enough money to pay the rent. Well, I don't have to hope if I know that God is sovereign and in control. And when it comes to tithing, I mean, that's as good of a guarantee you're going to get in the Bible. God says, test me on this and I will open up the gates of heaven so that there will be gifts to you that, not, that you can't, and you don't have enough room to, to hold. And this isn't, this isn't meant to be a, a sermon on tithing. The scripture makes that pretty clear what we're supposed to do with that. But I'm trying to get us to recognize the heart that surrenders control to God. Daniel was doing it with his life and he was simply just trying to, <laughs> he was just trying to eat the right food that he wouldn't be sinning against God. And for that, he was willing to give up his life. And here in America, we struggle with giving up 10%. It's kind of a bold thing to do if you think about it, to, to, to surrender, to put, put your life up for grabs kind of thing to say, King, I'm not going to eat that. And that takes us to our next, our next section with, um, oh yeah, the end, of, end of, the end of that little story is Daniel eats all these cool vegetables and fruits. After 10 days, he's like healthier than everyone else. And the guy's like, man, that's amazing. Like, you look great. Keep eating that food. We see God kind of come full circle. That's kind of a cool thing. But we're talking about that boldness of Daniel to step out. And so you'll flip over to uh, chapter two. We're going to get to the, the dream. It's going to be a little bit longer. So in verse 13, what just happened here was, well, give you a little bit of background. The king had had this horrible dream. He had this terrible nightmare type thing. And, and he'd gathered all of his like magicians and sorcerers and astrologers to say, tell me the dream that I had and interpret it. And these guys are like, whoa, 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 whoa. We'd love to interpret it. Just, just, just tell us the dream first. We'll interpret it for you. And he's like, and the king said, well, no, you're this, you can speak to the gods. Let them reveal to you the dream. Tell me what it is and then interpret it. And said, well, king, we, we, no one can do that. And so the king's getting angry. Tell me, if you can talk to the gods, if you really are all this powerful, then sh prove it. And the guys say, no king has ever asked that before. That's, that's only possible if there were the gods were here on earth and there are none. Which is kind of cool. Sets the stage for Daniel to show up later. So that's the background. The king was so frustrated. In verse 13. So the decree went out. And they began killing the wise men. Daniel, that's basically like a job role. It's called the wise men. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then with the counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. So that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And finishing in verse 19. 
Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. This is a really cool thing. Initially, we see Daniel hearing about the king's decree that we want to kill you. I'm already kind of taken aback. I'm like, dude, why are you not just hightailing out of the city? Like, get out. He seems like he's not panicking. In fact, he goes in to meet the very ruler, the very king who wants him dead. He's like, let's go, let's go talk face to face. Well, again, that's kind of bold that you could just kill you right there. You're making it easy for him. Guards, off with his head kind of thing, right? I think he's aware of the sovereignty of God. I think he's trusting that God has this situation under control. But at the same time, something really crazy happens. He goes into the king and sets up a meeting, like an appointment. He says, hey, king, give me, a, give me the night to think this over, and uh, I'll bring you the answer tomorrow. If I get it wrong, you'll know, go ahead and kill me then. I mean, he didn't really say that, but I imagine it's kind of what's going on. And, and so he's there, and that's like, to me, that just blows my mind. Like, if, 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 <laughs> if you're not a believer in God, um, you're not a follower of Jesus, this should, I mean, I, absolutely, this should be crazy. The guy's pretty much saying, I'm going to just read your mind. I mean, if, if you're a believer of God, you're a follower, you're calling yourself a Christian, this is still kind of crazy. I mean, how many of us would just be so willing to say, hey, let's, let's play a little Russian roulette really quick. You know, go ahead and pull the trigger. I'm going to be good. That's scary. That's terrifying. And that's kind of mind-boggling to me. But what he does next is just so, so inspiring to me. I was, I was talking with the youth students earlier this morning. He goes back home to his friends and they begin to pray. Now, something, that's a, something that I think is kind of interesting, Daniel's probably about 17, 18, maybe 20 years old right now. And we got four guys, maybe in their teens, I don't know, maybe it's a Friday night, and they're just staying up all night praying together? Like, that's crazy. What, again, that says something about Daniel's character and how much he's devoted and dedicated to God. I mean, that's, I, I honestly love the imagery of four young men coming together saying, God, help us. They're not whining. They're not complaining. They're not saying, this isn't fair. We didn't do anything. We shouldn't even be here. And why would God help us? He didn't help us when we were back in Jerusalem. None of that's happening. They're just praying. They're saying, God is the one who's going to save us. Again, they're not trying to run away either. Now I look at myself in that situation and I'm, I'm probably going to try to find a way out. I'm going to try to rely on something I can do. I think that's, I think that's all of our default response. We want to do something about it. Well, they do something about it too. They give up and say, God, we need you. And it's really, it's really exciting to see what God does because throughout the night, then God reveals the dream to Daniel. Like, that's just crazy. Like, he, he walks up there and he's like, oh, here's the dream. The next, next chapter is kind of outlined that. He says, here's everything you were thinking and here's everything it means. And the guy's just like, whoa. We're seeing the sovereignty of God. We're seeing that God is at work in this situation. He's intervening in the lives of his people. It's a, uh, I just want us to recognize that <clears throat> when we know who God is, then we're, we have a better understanding of what God can do. I think in your notes it says, that the audacity of our faith stems from the intimacy we have with God. That how, how bold we can be, how willing we are to step out and say, God, I will follow you. Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior. Our willingness to do that in various circumstances in life, the audacity of our faith comes from how deeply we know God. I believe Daniel knows that God can reveal the answer to him overnight. And so he, he puts himself out there. King, give me the night. I'll come back to you with the answer. He knows God is capable of all things. Do we believe that? I, I think about a time when I was 17, so maybe Daniel's age. I wasn't a, uh, I didn't believe in Jesus yet. I wasn't a Christian. And I'd signed up to run a marathon so 26.2 miles in Washington, D.C. It was called the Marine Corps Marathon. And uh, it's crazy. Like, the, like a couple of Marines will run it carrying this like giant flag with like 50 pound packs. And they all take turns carrying the flag. It's, it's really inspiring to see it. And just crazy because you're like, dude, you're carrying 50 pounds on your back while running 26 miles. And I remember going out to, uh, for a run one day. And I, I was, 
at that time in my life, I, I, didn't really, I didn't believe in God, right? I believed in myself, and I, I, I kind of made myself my own God. And I'd come to a point in my training where I just, I kind of failed. It was the first thing I'd ever really failed at. I typically am a really successful guy. I achieve all these things, but I'd failed. And so I went out on this run. I'd kind of given up on my training. And I was like, I just want to run until I pass out and like cease to exist or something. You know, you're a teenager. It's the end of the world, right? And I remember running and running and running. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know where I was at. I just wanted to run. I was running on the side of I-35. If you've ever been in Texas, um, it's, it's dumb. You shouldn't do that. And uh, I remember getting to a point where I was like, you know what? I, I just want to go home. I'm, I'm over this. And I remember for the first time in my life praying. And it was, it was kind of this prayer of like, God, help my unbelief. Like, I, I, like people say you're so powerful and say you can do all these things. I want to experience that. I want to, I want to know it. Just help me get back home. God, I want, I want to find my way back home. And the story's going to get a little bit longer. <laughs> but um, I get back home. It's crazy. But I, I had this, uh, this moment, though, with God. I was like, and God, one more thing <laughs> well, while you're listening. If this run is more than 10 miles long, because I've been running for about two and a half hours, and my, my thing was I was terrified to run more than 10 miles. I didn't think I could do it. I thought maybe my body would quit on me. It's like, God, if this run is more than 10 miles long, I, I, I have to believe that you are powerful and that you care. And that was, that was kind of my like, commitment. I was like, God, if, if this is more than 10 miles, I'll believe that you have the power to work in my life to do incredible things, and I'll start my training again kind of bargaining, which I wouldn't advise we do, and I don't think God typically works in that way, but through his grace, I think he loved me in that moment, met me where I was at. The next day, drove my car, it was like six miles, seven miles, turned on my road, like nine miles, like 9.8, 9.9, and I was freaking out, pulled into the driveway. It says 10.1, and I'm just crying. I'm like, what is going on? This is insane. 10.1 miles, and the words from the day before echoed in my mind, if this is more than 10.1 miles, I cannot stop. I cannot ignore the reality that God, one, you care. God, two, you are powerful, and you can do incredible things. So I had three months to train for this marathon, and it was, uh, it was crazy. I got hurt really bad two weeks before the race, and the doctor was like, you can't run for two weeks. And I was like, well, that's great, because my race isn't for two weeks. I'm good to go. And he's like, you're out your mind. But it was the first time I felt like maybe like God was going to do something. Like, like, I didn't know who he was. I, I don't think I even accepted Christ at that, po that point. But I began to see God's hand in my life. I began to see him working in that story, in that moment. And two weeks later, I, I ran the Marine Corps Marathon, and my time dropped like, like an hour. Um, I finished in five and a half hours, and it was crazy. And I don't think God did all of that just so I could have a fun little story to tell. Because a few months later, I would enter college, and I went through a really hard time in my life. And I was like, what do I do? And I started thinking back to that God who loved me, that God who had the power to do things that I couldn't do. And I was like, that's what I want. That race was in October, and in December of that year, I accepted Christ. I just in my bedroom, and, or on my living room by myself. And then I began to learn more and more and more what it meant to be a follower of Christ, and it took about a year. But God is constantly at work in our lives and he's, he's working things out for good. I, I wish I could say it's always good to us. In the times when we don't understand what's happening, we don't, we don't understand what's happening in that circumstance, we can at least trust in God's character. We know who he is. He's revealed himself here. And that's where we begin to find kind of our last part with the den. And so if you go ahead to Daniel 6, we'll see that God's sovereignty gives us hope in times of adversity. When things are going really, really wrong and we just feel like we're up against a wall, we feel like there's just nothing that could ever make this work. The fact that we can believe and trust in God, that he is powerful, that he loves us, we can trust in him to work in that situation, we can have hope. He can be our refuge if you spend a little bit of time just reading through the book of Psalms, you'll see all these songs, these, these poems written about, God, save me. You're the only one. The enemy is at my gate. The warriors are coming. Save me. God's sovereignty reveals hope in adversity. It's never over. And so, starting in verse six. So these governors and satraps these are basically like just kind of rulers over the city. There's a new king. Um, 
I forgot the other guy's name, but he's gone. <laughs> Darius is back. Um, Darius is the new king. He's a Persian. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. It's the customary uh, greeting for the king. These guys were trying to plot a trap for Daniel. They really despised him. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps and counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions, prays, any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Meanwhile, the king's like, everyone's going to pray to me for 30 days? That's kind of cool. I mean, I am the king. I'm a big deal. Signs it. He kind of gets tricked here a little bit. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days, except you, O king, naturally, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, that the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. And so they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who is one of the captives, they're kind of putting him down already, from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or the decree that you have signed, but makes petition three times a day. These guys set this trap for Daniel, knowing the only way they could get him to mess up is that they did something between him and God, and they forced him to pray. What we see here is Daniel's going to be put in a really tough spot. The punishment for this is to be thrown into the den of lions. Before in the previous two stories, Daniel was in his teens. About this point with the new king and everything that's happened, he's close to his 80s. Historians estimate somewhere between like 80, 85, something like that. He's an older guy. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to be in my 80s and having almost risked my life so I could eat vegetables stepped out and like risked my life saying I can interpret this dream that I don't even know what it is at the time of saying I can interpret it but I'm trusting God's going to reveal it pretty soon and then being saying well shoot now I'm going to be thrown in a den of lions like God what are you doing I mean like give the guy a break I thought since we're Christians and followers of God especially someone like Daniel we should be being protected and everything should just work out it kind of does work out but maybe not the way we thought what's really What's really interesting here is we see, we see the insufficiency of man a little bit. The king and, and Daniel become good friends. And the king was like, oh no, I messed up. It says when, in verse 14, and the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. He set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. It says he labored till morning. The law was that he'd have to pretty much make a decision by, by evening that night or dawn the next morning, sorry. And so he spent all this time trying to find a loophole but not even the king could save him. It's kind of a reminder that we can't just trust in the works of man, but, but God. And we see Daniel, he hasn't even really been a focus of this story yet. We just know that he wasn't willing to hide his prayer. He's like, fine, I'm going to keep praying. And that we're about, to, we're about to catch up with him being thrown in the, in the lion's den. But before that, I want us to see something that's really unique. This is one of those times where um, we'll see our, the translators of Scripture kind of do some fun stuff. But the author of Daniel uses a really interesting word. In verse 16, it says, So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And that word will is the, is the one that's in question. If you're running um, King James or New King James, it's going to say he will deliver you. If you're doing like an NIV or ESV, it's going to say something like he may or something like that. The reason for that is the Hebrew word, it's kind of a fun one to say, it's a yeshes abinak. And it basically, all it really means is it comes from like shazeh or something like that. And it just means to deliver or to rescue. But it's the form of the verb that the author uses that leaves it open for interpretation. And I don't think it's open for interpretation so much to say like, 
oh, the translators are crazy. I think it's because when the audience would have heard this story, they would have known, here's an opportunity for me to look at, look at myself. If I was the king and I was looking down at Daniel in this horrible situation, literally in a pit, would I, would I think that the Lord will save you? Because the word can be translated in at least four different ways. It can be translated as a, I hope he saves you. Or like a, yeah, see if God's even able to save you. Like a challenge against God. Or it can be a declaration of faith. God will save you. And so we have to ask ourselves that. When we're in these situations, are we, are we taking the position of God will save me? God will work this out. God is able. And that's probably a better way of saying it. Or are we just wistfully hoping, I, I hope this works out. I hope the universe lines up and something good happens. I, there's a couple of people I, I'm friends with on Facebook and um, this one person in particular always posts these things. Uh, hey, me and my boyfriend are going through some hard times. Please uh, send some good juju and good karma and good vibes our way and it's gonna work out. And I'm like, where do you get juju? <laughs> like, I spent lots of time at Walmart. I can't find juju. <laughs> And when I think of good vibes, I don't know, I'm, I'm like Brookstone, they got those like chairs and shaky. Like that's not going to help you pay the rent or whatever she's dealing with. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't understand. Do we find ourselves in that place or are we even just bitter? <sighs> See if God can save you. Great God, this, this, is, this is impossible. We see that with our family sometimes. That person will never change. I'll never forgive that person. But, but, if, but if we believe that God's able, that kind of changes our, our paradigm, our perspective a little bit, right? Give me one second. Oof. But here's, here's something I think is kind of interesting because in a life and death situation, I think a lot of us would kind of say God will save. God is able. And I think our actions demonstrate that. You know, life and death. Oh my gosh, um, my, my, my child is, is, it was in a car accident. I know God can fix this. I know God can take care of her. But let's, let's, let's turn the dial down a little bit because the truth doesn't change. Let's, let's go to something a little different. I brought up rent earlier. Maybe we don't have money to pay you next month's rent. Are we completely freaking out, cursing God, saying, God, why would you let this happen? Maybe you lost your job. And you're saying, God, there's no way we'll make it now. You've taken everything from me. Maybe we just got divorced and life is just not going the way we thought it would. In that moment, is God able? Or are we just like, do something, God, if you can. And I think, I think we've been in all three of those places before. Life is hard. Some weeks are really hard. But if we recognize the sovereignty of God the same way Daniel does, we'll see, we'll see incredible things happen. And with the end, in the end of this thing right here, we see in verse 19, then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. This is kind of funny. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice. Kind of get a little idea of what he thought. Daniel's dead. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. That customary title. So he's still being polite, which is crazy. <laughs> My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, by the way, I've done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Daniel's a great book to read. And that's just the history side. If you keep going, uh, I think in your notes, there's something about chapter nine. It's a phenomenal prayer that Daniel prays. And it's one that I think is even more pertinent to our day and age right now than I don't know, most things I've, I've been able to see. It's just, it's a phenomenal prayer of just repentance and confession. And, and we see Daniel's heart here, y'all. He's a guy who's, can, like even, even the King Darius is aware of it. He says, has the God whom you continually serve. I mean, we talk so much about living life on mission, about like 
telling people about Jesus by our actions, Daniel was able to do it. I wonder if our coworkers and our friends could say, yeah, that person continually serves God, or if they even know that we're a Christian. Daniel was willing to step out in so many ways, even to the point of surrendering his life on several occasions. The third one, I don't think was his fault. Well, no, yeah, he decided to pray. He was willing to surrender his life three times, trusting that God was gonna take care of it. You know, and I, I started off talking about just my, my struggle with this week and, and some of my just kind of like, oh, it's so busy, it's so crazy. And it's really hard sometimes because we look in the New Testament and James, he tells us, count it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds because it produces perseverance and, and strengthens your faith. It's really hard because most of the time when we talk about blessings, it's because we just got a new car or a new house. But what if some of our blessings are the times of adversity? where we can demonstrate the glory and might of God by our trust in his sovereign rule, by our trust in the fact that he is working in our lives. You see, if we want to, if we want to find a life like Daniel, if we want to experience God like Daniel, we've got to trust that God is working in this situation. And through that, there's a call on us. If we trust that God's in control and he says, go, and you say, I'm not sure, we're not quite being obedient there. If he says go, and we say, I'm afraid, and he says go, so I trust you though, because you're in control. When we trust God's sovereignty, we can be obedient to him, no matter the cost. We just gotta spend time in his word. This is, this is God, this is how we get to know him better. And remember the, the, the intimacy or the, uh, the audacity of our faith comes from the intimacy of how well we know him. There's adventures I can go on with my wife. I know she'll do it because I spend time with her and there's other ones I know she won't because I spend time with her. We know what God is capable to do. We know how he works when we spend time getting to know him. Daniel prayed like crazy. I am. I feel, I feel at a loss for words. I don't really know the right way to come up with some cool conclusion right now. But I think if Daniel were here, we would just pray and we would trust God's sovereignty. I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know what your week has been like. I don't know what what happened in the car ride before you came to this, this room today, this, this body of believers. But I do know that the God I serve, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is sovereign in your life, in this church, in this country, and in this world. And he is working out his purposes for his glory and for his goodness, his, his ple perfect and pleasing will. Please believe that, church. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the person of Daniel, a man so dedicated to your, your call in his life that he was willing to surrender his life so he could eat vegetables. God, sometimes I'm afraid just to share my faith for fear of rejection. Lord, we see, we see in Daniel a man who loved you so much that nothing else mattered. God, I pray for myself and everyone here at Belmar, that we, we can be a people like Daniel, a praying people, a people so fully aware of God's sovereignty that we can step out boldly with the utmost audacity to share your gospel with the people of Lakewood, Denver, and take back Colorado. Lord, let this happen. If we want to see revival, God, let it start within us first. May we be that change, God. Use us in our families. Use us in our jobs. Use us in our classrooms. And Lord, we pray for your grace for those times that we get scared. We pray for your mercy for those times when we feel like you're not there. God, through your word, may you continue to teach us and show us that you are powerful and you love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.